During strength training, muscle fibres experience a stimulus that causes them to increase in size if they are activated and if they are shortening slowly so that they produce a high force, which is what causes the mechanical loading that they need in order to grow. Now, motor units are what control muscle fibres, and motor units are arranged in recruitment order, and low threshold motor units only control very small numbers of muscle fibres, maybe 10 or 20, whereas high threshold motor units control thousands of muscle fibres. So the increases in size of muscle fibres associated with low threshold motor units doesn't tend to cause much overall muscle growth, whereas the increase in size of muscle fibres associated with high threshold motor units causes a lot of muscle growth. So recruitment of motor units during strength training is really important because if we only recruit low threshold motor units then because each motor unit only controls maybe 10 or 20 muscle fibres that doesn't really lead to a lot of muscle growth afterwards. We need to recruit the high threshold motor units which each recruit maybe one or two thousand muscle fibres each and that is what leads to the overall increase in size that we call hypertrophy. But there are actually two other reasons why we need to recruit the high threshold motor units and that's because the muscle fibres that are associated with the low threshold motor units are less responsive to strength training and this seems to be for two reasons. One is that they're much more oxidative and oxidative fibres tend not to increase in size as much after strength training as less oxidative muscle fibres. And secondly, it's because they have a, a higher training status. So muscle fibres associated with low threshold motor units are used all the time. Whatever we do in, in our activities of daily life, are, they involve these muscle fibres with low threshold motor units. So essentially they've been trained constantly, day in, day out, forever as long as you've been alive, whereas high threshold motor units contain muscle fibres that may not ever be used by some people. They may never use those muscle fibres because they've never actually uh, performed a movement that's required them to function. So they have a, a, the muscle fibres of low threshold motor units have a much higher training status than the muscle fibres of high threshold motor units, and so they therefore don't really grow as fast after strength training anyway. With this background, we can now think about training volume and what training volume actually is. So you'll generally find three different definitions of training volume. One of them is the number of sets performed to failure, and that's regardless of what load and rep range is being used. So we define volume simply as one, two, three, four, or five, or whatever many number of sets you're going to do. Um, secondly, we define volume as the uh, number of sets multiplied by the number of reps, and obviously that creates a very large number whenever we're using a light weight, and a very uh, small number if we're using a heavy weight or a moderate weight. And thirdly, there is volume load, which is where we multiply the number of sets by the number of reps uh, by the actual weight that's on the bar. And that still tends to give higher numbers for um, sets involving lighter weights and higher reps than sets involving heavier or, or moderate weights and, and those rep ranges. Um, but ultimately, we have these three different measurements. Now, the most important thing to understand is that the only measurement of volume that's ever been linked to muscle growth in any way, shape or form is the number of sets performed to failure. So in most uh, studies, in, in sort of meta-analyses of those studies, we generally find that the more sets to failure that are performed, the greater the resulting muscle growth is for that given muscle group. However, if we look at studies that have uh, tested two different strength training programs, one of which involves moderate loads and one of which involves light loads, and they're both performing the same number of sets to failure, then those two programs will produce the same muscle growth, but the, the group that trains with the lighter loads and the higher rep ranges will produce several times as many uh, sets times reps, uh, so that measure of volume will be much higher, 
and it will also produce a higher level of volume load. So we have this situation where you can perform the same number of sets to failure with different loads and different rep ranges and achieve exactly the same muscle growth, but they will have very different volume in terms of sets times reps and volume in terms of volume load. So as we can see, the only measurement of volume that's related to muscle growth is the number of sets to failure. Volume as in sets times reps and volume load are completely unrelated to muscle growth. They're useless measures of volume. This happens because the only way in which muscles increase in size is through an increase in the individual fibre size of the muscle fibres associated with high threshold motor units. So when we are performing a set of strength training and we're not recruiting those high threshold motor units, no hypertrophy has been stimulated. In exactly the same way as if we go out for a run, we don't stimulate any muscle growth, despite the fact that we are using the same type of muscular contractions to produce force. We uh, perform many thousands of repetitions, but we don't trigger any muscle growth, and that's because we're predominantly using low threshold motor units. So there's no increase in overall muscle size. During sets of light and moderate load strength training, large parts of the set involve no recruitment of high threshold motor units. It's only maybe the last five reps of each set that involve the recruitment of high threshold motor units alongside a slowing of the bar, which leads to a slowing of the muscle fiber shortening velocity, which is what allows mechanical loading on those muscle fibers. So in any given set of light or moderate loads, it's only really the last five reps of any set that produce any stimulus that leads to hypertrophy. So as you can see, it really doesn't matter what rep range we train in, because it's only the last five reps that count. So when we're looking at training volume, and we're trying to compare moderate and light load sets, we can look at the last five reps of each set to failure and say, those are our stimulating reps. And if we're counting sets to failure with light loads or moderate loads, then we count exactly the same number of stimulating reps. And this explains why we can have very different measures of volume as in sets times reps and volume load between these different training programs and yet have identical muscle growth when measured by the number of sets to failure. So the question is, why do we allocate the last five reps of a set to being stimulating reps and not say four or six reps? And the answer to that question is that we've traditionally divided rep ranges into one to five, six to 15 and 15 plus, with that being heavy, moderate and light loads. So heavy loads are basically anything that is as heavy as a five repetition maximum or heavier. And if we look at the way in which bar speed changes over a set with either moderate or light loads, then what we tend to find is that the decreases in bar speed toward the end of a set start to make those final five reps look very, very similar in terms of bar speed and therefore muscle fiber shortening velocity as a five repetition maximum set. And in fact, the final rep of a set, regardless of the load that we use, actually moves at a very similar speed to a one repetition maximum. So those final five reps in terms of mechanical loading on the activated muscle fibers are essentially doing the same job as a five repetition maximum set. And if we assume that motor unit recruitment follows a very similar pattern and increases gradually towards the end of a set, then we've got exactly the same conditions in the final five reps of a set with any load whatsoever as we have during that five repetition maximum. There are two other observations that support using five reps as the number of stimulating reps per set to failure. And firstly, it's that motor unit recruitment levels tend to be maximal during sets or during um, muscular contractions that involve a level of force that is equivalent to lifting a five repetition maximum load. So we can be fairly certain that when we're lifting a load that is a five repetition maximum, that we're achieving um, maximal motor unit recruitment or very close to it. So the second factor is that if we compare 
the effects of long-term strength training programs with heavy loads that are heavier than a five repetition maximum, say a three repetition maximum, with a strength training program involving moderate loads, then the same number of sets to failure in both groups won't produce the same amount of muscle growth. And in fact, training with moderate loads produces more muscle growth. And we have to increase the number of sets with these heavy loads in order to produce the same amount of muscle growth as, as sets to failure with moderate loads. And this tells us that we're not achieving the same number of stimulating reps in both of these training programs. And in fact, training with three repetition maximums will only have three repetitions, uh, three stimulating reps per set, whereas obviously all of the moderate loads uh, training to failure will involve um, five repetitions, five stimulating reps per set. So we can see that in order for the uh, heavier loads uh, that are heavier than the five repetition maximum to achieve the same amount of muscle growth as training with moderate loads, we have to increase the number of sets, and that's exactly what we find in the literature.